uh, we'll go ahead and just jump into uh, prayer, and then we'll we'll uh, con- I, I think I, if I can get through my notes, I'm pretty sure I will conclude with ecclesiology today. God in heaven, thank you so much that we are uh, privileged and we're honored to be able to gather together in peace to see who you are, to read your word, to uh, to, to, to grow in grace and knowledge of, of you. It is something that is not a, a difficult task, but it does take its dedication, and we, we pray that we do it honor. Thank you for those who are here. We pray for those who are not, as they uh, either traveling or ill or uh, just too far away. Although they are of us, they're, we pray for those who are not with us right now. We love them, and we pray that we continue to show grace and mercy to everyone that we see. That we are an example of uh, of of how to be a a believer, a group of believers that truly care about each other and love, grace and mercy, as you have shown us love, grace and mercy. Thank you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Ecclesiology. Before we actually finish the study of the church, and we are concluding some of the the, the, the program today, um, I, I felt a little uncomfortable being on the 13th lesson. Well, yeah, that's, that's, that's bad luck, isn't it? Can we just skip 13 and just move to 14? Do we do that like on hotel rooms? You know. But before we finish, it is important to understand that we need to understand how all this ends. Now, it, it kind of segues very nicely into our next program because we're going to talk about the end of the church, and we're also going to talk about eschatology in a beginning not next week what let me ha- i'll have a moment of honesty i'm not ready <laughs> to talk about eschatology i am i've been i've been working on a couple different things and i've been working on eschatology i'm like i need to get through a few more points because i want to get make sure i get all my ideas out to the end before i start making statements at the beginning and then have to revise those statements all right so i'm, I'm working through some stuff so we are going to take a few weeks to kind of go over some, you know, one-offs, some some things I need to get off my chest anyway. Not about you all, just thoughts that are in my head about scripture, about the world. So there's a couple of things I want to talk about topically. And then in about three, four or weeks or so, we'll begin eschatology. It parallels perfectly with what we're doing on Wednesdays, by the way, because we're beginning Matthew 24 and 25, which is eschatology. So it's going to be just nice and parallel for a little while. Um, but we need to find out exactly how this ends. We're here. We're part of the universal body of Christ. What's the end game? Is there an end game? What's going on here? So we want to make sure that we understand this to the best of our ability and be biblical, not theological. Do you remember what I mean by that? Biblical, not theological. Theological says that there are things that people have taught previously that have a lot of times come from an inference, an inference of, hey, if this is true, then this, and they'll cling to the inference as if it were from the Bible, but in actuality, it simply just came from a logical leap, okay? Without getting too much into eschatology, again, um, but we do want to make sure that we understand what is the future for this church? And so we want to talk about the conclusion. Now, again, this is a concluding message. I have at the end what we've covered as kind of like the concluding points. If I can get to that, we'll go ahead and do that. If not, it'll be in my notes. The church as an organization for many years and by many people have taught that the church is an eternal program. So most people, when you talk about the church, will teach it as the church is universal, not only of all the believers everywhere, but of all the believers for all time from Pentecost to rapture. That is the embodiment of the church. And they'll teach it as, a, as an eternal program. So the people that came before us, they're still part of the church. And so... And I'll tell you right now, that all sounds well and good. 
But when you start going into the text in which they use to defend this, we have, I think we have a little bit of an issue here. The first passage they go to to defend the universal makeup of the church or the eternality of the church is Matthew 16, 18. In Matthew 16, 18, this is when Peter says that Jesus is the Christ. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood will not did not reveal this to you, but my father is in heaven. And I say that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. And they say, see, the church is an eternal entity because nothing will overthrow it. Now, I'm, I know that everyone here has not been in my Matthew class. Do you remember the lesson from this, though, for those who are there? Okay, in Matthew 16, 18. It is the word ecclesia. You remember our lessons on ecclesia. It does not always mean the church. Okay. Ecclesia here. I'm going to give you my conclusion because I don't have time to go into all the exegesis for it because that took me an entire lesson last time. Okay. But we understood that this is not about our current administration. He is not talking about what he is going to do in our time. In our, in our administration. This is rather about the remnant, the remnant theology of Israel. In Israel, there will be a time in which he will build up his remnant. Matthew 16, 18 is about the kingdom of heaven. How do I know that? Next verse, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. It's not about the, the establishment of the next stage. Now, people say, well, didn't Peter have the keys of the, of the church? Nowhere is that stated. So when and we talked about when do we think Peter will take on that responsibility? I think he'll take on that responsibility in the kingdom of heaven. Okay? Where he will be able to, and, and again, what, what does a key mean? Do, 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 you, do you remember the times in which people used to get the key to the city? Does it mean they're mayor? They're not mayor. It's it's a, it's an honorary. You know, it's like, oh, look how it's, it's, a, it's a, a great blessing. I think, personally, just to be like, kind of like, you know, flipping with it, that there, after the kingdom is established, Jesus is going to come, okay, Peter, come up and get the keys to the kingdom. And he'll have the keys. Now, will he have authority with that? Yes, obviously, that's a 19. But this is not about the next administration. This is about the ecclesia that Jesus Christ will establish based upon himself and the proclamation that he is the Christ. Now, is there similarities between our administration and that? Yes, but this is about the, uh, the eschatology of Israel, the remnant theology of Israel. The concept of the church, our time, being eternal, cannot be established from this verse. Why? Because it doesn't say it. It does not say that. It's not referring to our time. The second passage that is often used to establish the church in, in kind of etern, eternal perspectives is Revelation 19. And Revelation 19, 7 through 8, and also 21, 9 through 14. So those two passages there usually are relating to, they, they will say, this is where the church comes back on the scene. And those, most, people, most people who are dispensational in thought will say that, the, that, 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 that they go away before the beginning of the tribulation. They'll say between uh, chapters 3 and 4, the church goes away. There's a vision that, that, that John has about the saints who are crying out, uh, saying, how long, O Lord, that's seen in heaven. Some people talk about the elders being part of the church, but most people, when they get to Revelation 19, they say, see, here's where we, the church, specifically come back. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And they'll look at this passage and they'll say, the church is the what? Bride of Christ. Where do they get that from? Well, they start here and then work backward towards other passages, which could be used to, which what they say is alluding to the bride of Christ. 
They coupled this with Revelation 21, 9 through 12, then through 14. One of the seven angels and seven bowls filled with seven, uh, the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away to the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem. And I go, so when we had this discussion before, you know, Luther talked about this in his lessons. I talked about this previously. We had a conference here in which Eric also presented this information and said, um, the, the, the bride's the Jerusalem. And how do they and how do they, they kind of explain this, by the way? Do you remember? They say the church fills up Jerusalem. Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, is filled by the church. And this is where you get this concept of a church, the, the church, us, Pentecost to, to the rapture, being the overall entity, the overarching administration, which will even encompass Israel. They say that is that they, they the main claim is that the church is the main focal point, the main focal point of eschatology. It's not. Okay, we'll talk about that when we deal with eschatology. Well, we've been dealing with that in Matthew in parts. All right. So this passage, coupled with the belief that the church is the bride of Christ, it is important that we understand the church is never called the bride of Christ. The term bride of Christ is never used. We have this here saying, I'll come and show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. Okay. Um, and, and again, they get into to some dis differentiation. They say Israel is the wife of God. The church is the wife of the lamb. And it's like, it's, it gets a little convoluted and like they, they begin, they, again, they, they, they take verses and they, they leapfrog and they infer, they take the inference and say, hold on to this as the doctrine. Now, again, 2 second, second Corinthians 11.2 deals with this. This is where they met one of the main verses. My thing's kind of slowing, not moving as quickly as it should. Hello. It's on my screen. All right, let's try it again. The, the, by the way, this is one of the reasons why I've kind of inferred a few people. It may be time to get to, to, to update. Since it does not want to cooperate. Second Corinthians 11.2. You can turn there if you like. We'll do this old school. You remember before COVID, I never had verses on the screen. Every single time we read a verse, everyone turned to there. I like that, but I understand that there's people who like that too. Hmm. Well, I'll just move to this, this line because the verses aren't coming up for some reason. So in 2 Corinthians 11, 2, it says, For I am jealous for you, for you are with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to, a, to one husband, so that, Christ, to the, so that to Christ I might present to you as a pure virgin. Now, if you left it there, and you go, Ha! Huh, Paul betrothed us, the church, to Christ. Therefore, we are the betrothed bride of Christ. Now, if you pull that out, that's what it makes it look like. But the passage is metaphorical. He uses this kind of idea of a chaste bride in order to make sure that he is communicating verses 3 and 4. In verses 3 and 4, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom you have not preached you re, and you, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received or a different gospel you you have handled this beautifully so in other words he's saying you know what you've done well in the past but i'm afraid you're not going to be that pure virgin when i present you to christ because you but you're going to adopt a bad doctrine so he's using this concept of a chaste virgin presented to her husband 
in order to 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 understand that he wants them to continue on with the purity of the doctrines of Jesus Christ has nothing to do with eschatology. In Ephesians chapter 5, so Ephesians chapter 5, we have verse 23. On our 11 o'clock hour, at, before Ephesians, before Galatians, we dealt with Ephesians. And we actually taught on this very specifically. Again, I'm going to give you my conclusions. I'm not going to defend it all. Why? I don't have time. Um, I would Anybody who likes to discuss this kind of thing, I'm, I'm up for discussion. You know me. So we'll sit and talk for hours on these things. But in 523, for the husband is the head of the wife, so Christ is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. And then it goes to a kind of a concept there between how the husband is to treat the wife because that's how Christ treated the church, which I agree. But it doesn't say that the church is the bride of Christ. The church is the body of Christ and believers become members of his body through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But the text never calls the church there the 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 bride of Christ. In fact, it's it's kind of strange because there's different types of of metaphors that are used to describe who we are as a universal unit. We are the body. We are the building. We're the temple of God. We are his field. That type of thing. All these and why? Because they all have a different point, a different perspective to use. The relationship of this type of, uh, of Christ to us is used as how he prepared and how he uh, provided for the church and gave us an example of husbands to be to wives. It does not say that as a church, we are also functioning as a wife towards Christ. It doesn't say that here. So the main emphasis, typically, when it comes down to the eschatology of the church being eternal, is usually focused in Revelation 19 and 21, which we've already read. And notice that it talks about the saints. Now, this is where a lot of times people, they, they will paint with a broad brush. Well, it calls believers in the, um, in, the, in the letters saints, and so therefore, who are the saints? They'll say, that's the church. No. Anybody reconciled to God is called the saints. In fact, in Ephesians, it says, you, church, have part with the saints. And we can, we can make an argument that the saints refer back to who? Previous believers in God, those who have been reconciled to God, I would say, from Adam. And so there's a co-heirship. Um, now, how I've explained the airship in the past is that there is an airship for Israel and there's an airship for believers who are not Israel. And they run parallel in eschatology. We are part of the kingdom of God, but we are not ruling and reigning from Israel. That's Israel's job. We will be ruling and reigning from outside of Israel. What I've, you know, kind of like that spillover from the actual kingdom of heaven, which is the restored kingdom of Israel. So saints, holy ones, and I, and that's anyone reconciled to God. Enoch, according to Jude, prophesied this, that he comes with many thousands of his saints. The reason why the translators don't translate that saints, but they translate it holy ones, is because they go, oh, well, we're not talking about the church because Enoch did not know about the church, so how can he prophesy about it? Exactly, <laughs> because all saints will return with him who have already passed on. All of them. Revelation, specifically the, the, talking about Revelation 19-21, we have to remember that Revelation is the culmination of the promises, the prophecies, and covenants made to Israel. You begin with the letters to the churches, the seven churches that were current at that time. And then it and then it tells them what will happen at the end. He's going to write the things that were, the things that are, and the things that will be. Okay? The things that will be become basically chapter four and forward. Chapter four and forward has nothing to do with the church. 
All of the images and the language used is traced back to Hebrew scriptures. They will even admit this. They said all the imagery of a bride, betrothed, and all these different things, that's a picture of a Hebrew bride. I'm not Hebrew. We, we, we don't take on that type of imagery because that's all limited or, or given to Israel. If you want to take it, the bride concepts and this idea of the betrothed and the and the kind of the wayward wife, so to speak, and the kind of the regathering of everything together, go back into Joel, Hosea, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Read those passages about the relationship that God has with Israel, and you will see it parallel perfectly with Revelation. And it just moves forward. If you want to get more detail, you can take on the, what, 225 lessons you did? About? More or less. More or less. <laughs> Probably more than less. So all of the images, the language used to trace back to Hebrew scriptures, not the epistles. The church is never brought up again. So Revelation contains us as saints, but we're there together with everybody. Is Israel still a thing? Yes. Is, are the nations still a thing? Yes. But it's about Israel, her Messiah, her bridegroom. Where else do they go to demonstrate the bride of Christ? They go to Matthew. And the, and the parables on the ten virgins, which we're going to talk about soon, on Wednesday. It's not about us. It's about Israel. And all of that that was that was prophesied about Israel and the and the reestablishment of Israel as a kingdom is is contained within this concept of the return of Christ and this marriage feast. Do I think we'll be at the marriage feast? Absolutely, we'll be there, but we're not the ones getting married. In fact, didn't did you suggest that the that the marriage feast was basically just a marriage feast? It's not really a wedding going on, or did you say that there was a wedding concept there? It was a wedding concept. But they would be dealing with Israel? Yeah, okay. So, And and some people have suggested that Israel and the church are getting married, kind of marrying together. I'm like, ah, because during the millennial kingdom, there's still a separation. It's not a, it's, you know, we're not homogenous yet. So we have to be very careful with the bride of Christ concepts and be in a, and and just make sure that we understand that that idea of bride of Christ and the church being eternal is not stated but rather inferred and when you make a doctrine out of an inference this is where we create friction because the because why because we can't prove it you believe it one thing i believe a different thing you're like oh see we're fighting now I go, but we're not fighting with scripture we're fighting with our thoughts and whoever can argue the best wins. Uh, when it comes down to this type of information, when we're talking about um, specifically about these types of passages, I become very narrow on Scripture. Why? I'll tell this at the end, but I'll say it now too. I believe that at times we, the church steals from Israel promises made to her instead of to us. Now, I did give you four reasons why I am convinced that there is, this is a temporary administration. This, this, the, the administration that we're in now is an earthbound, temporary. It's for here, and where it doesn't continue in heaven. It's not an eternal entity. It's, it solely exists as kind of a buffer, and a great buffer, 2,000 years. Fantastic. A time between the, 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 the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. And the, and the rapture, that's a fantastic time frame. We've been here for a long time. The church has done amazing things as the body of Christ and the doctrines we have. How do we know that? 2,000 years later, in Kansas City, Missouri, we're still talking about it. That's an attestment to God's provision and what he's given for us to do and the things that have been accomplished. So number one, the re main reason why I believe that this is a a temporary ministration and an earthbound ministry, it's not a heavenly one, is that the goals and purposes of the church all refer to our life here. We went through the goals and purposes. We went through, I believe, eight, eight of them. You know, they dealt with to grow, to build each other up, to evangelize the world, to draw Israel in. How do you do that from heaven? How do you do that in eternity? 
I mean, if the church were going to be an eternal entity, something unique that's going to be eternal, then there has to be a different purpose. There is no building up in heaven. There is no training. There is no call for unity. We'll all be unified. There's no evangelism in eternity. Obviously, Israel is, is saved by that time. There's no, we don't, we're not drawing Israel anymore. So therefore, because of this, because the goals and purpose of the church all refer to our life here and, and basically unto this age, at the until the end of this age, that I do not, I'm not, I, I'm convinced that it does not go forward into that. Second, the dead in Christ are not referred to anywhere as the church or the body. The body of Christ, the euphemism for the body of Christ, the unity that we're supposed to share, okay, all have a function on this life. So if, if uh, like, again, it's the old, um, you know, casting crown song. If we are the body, why aren't his hands serving? Why aren't his feet going? That type of idea, right? So in heaven, how are we supposed to function as the body of Christ? Are we retired? The retired body of Christ, is that is that the heaven? I, I don't, you know, that this, this is not explained. And furthermore, again, from heaven, how are the, how is the body supposed to function? When we are no longer the body of Christ, we are what? Face to face with him. Third reason. The body of Christ is used to demonstrate his function. It kind of goes back, it goes back into the, the number two as well. The body of Christ is used to demonstrate his function in relation to one another and to unbelievers. So there's two main purposes for the body. Number one, to edify itself in love, to build it up in truth and to serve one another so that we're all satisfied that there's no need. If there's a need that needs to be met within the body, we're supposed to fill that need. Furthermore, there's supposed to be a outreach concept there too. So the body language Pun intended. Thank you. Thank you. Is that of what we need now due to the weakness of our flesh? When we're gone, our flesh is put aside. The mortal puts on immortality. The corrupt puts on incorruption. Therefore, we no longer are, we don't, the, the, the body then no longer has a prescribed biblical function. <clears throat> now, what did I do that I just accused other people of doing? Inferred. I inferred. So therefore, I can't really establish myself fully upon this. But there's one passage, exegetical analysis, that I believe demonstrates that the administration, that this current administration is temporal. And that is Romans 11. 17 through 25. Romans 11, 17 through 25. Hey, look. It worked. Who was I talking with? Like I was talking about how you can um, get almost any book you want on computer now. Even if you can even scan it yourself and different things. And people are like, but there's something about these pages. And I agree. I, I, I Almost every book that I own that I really value, I have in both print and electronic form. Electronic form because I can research it a lot faster. Book form because if I just want to sit down and read it, it's no better. Romans chapter 11, verse 17. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive were grafted in among them and became partakers of with them of the root of the olive tree do not be arrogant toward the branches but if you are arrogant remember that it is not you who supports the root but the root supports you you will say then branches were broken off so that i might be grabbed in quite right they were broken off for their unbelief but you stand by your faith do not be conceited but fear for if god did not spare the natural branches he will not spare you either. Behold, then, the kindness and severity of God, 
to those who fell severity, but to you, God's kindness. And if you continue in his kindness, otherwise you will also be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So, there's a lot of different commentaries written on this subject. I taught this many moons ago now. You know, this is this is a, this is a long time ago, right? The tree in this passage is not about going to heaven. It's not about being grafted into Israel. The, the tree itself and that, that idea is dealing with the administration of God. Because national Israel rejected her Messiah, national Israel was cut off from participating in the administration of God. All right? Believing Gentiles were grafted in. Gentiles is kind of like the, 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 the wild olive OK, it's not a it's not a individual branches. It's the, the believing Gentile is considered, considered as one branch. OK, it's a it's a, an entire entity. This is not a threat to individuals. Otherwise, individuals be cut out of the church. It doesn't say that. Right. But eventually, if the church, the, the, the wild branches, branch becomes conceited and no longer functions properly he has the right to break it off and continue on with the natural olive which is israel so because is national israel rejected messiah believing gentiles were grafted in but again notice there's that potential for being broken off it's not about salvation it's about privilege in serving in the administration this is not about individual um, congregations being broken off. This is not about individual people being broken off. This is about the entity of the church being broken off and the administration being restored back to Israel. The fact that national Israel failed as a nation due to unbelief is true. And he says, but don't become arrogant because you're, you're not better than Israel was. You just simply believe. But once the time of the Gentiles is complete, then what? Once that's complete, then what happens? What happens is the administration goes back to Israel. So can we understand here that administratively how it functions has everything to do with this planet, this earth, the physical function. Jesus Christ returns and he establishes his kingdom, but that's the restored kingdom of Israel, then there's a parallel concept where we will be serving and reigning with him, but not from Israel. But in that before this age ends, this church as the administration of God will be cut off and it will return back to Israel. So there is a specified time in eschatology when the church will cease to be the administration of God. When? We call that the rapture. How do I know that the church is no longer the administration of God on earth after the rapture? 
Again, go back into eschatology from the Old Testament, as well as uh, go back to Daniel, and then go over to Revelation. And who are the witnesses? 144,000, what? Jews, N not believers. 144,000 Jews. Can Gentiles become believers during that time? Yes, and many will. But they're not part of the administration. They're simply there to survive if they can. In eschatology, Revelation, Matthew 24, 25, going back into the prophets of the Old Testament, you deal with that eschatology, it's about Israel. Notice that when Paul talks about eschatology, it's all about avoiding this time, the eschatology. You don't have to be there. You shouldn't fear. Be prepared. He's going to come back and take us out. We're not appointed to wrath. Israel will go through the wrath. We're not appointed to wrath. And once again, there's this parallel concept, parallel promises. Israel has promises, restoration promises. We have promises that run parallel with it, but they're different. We end differently. And at the end, you know, I, I, I don't, again, we, we're looking through, a, I'm going to say this when we get to eschatology, we're looking through a keyhole into a dim room, through a plate glass window, and all we see is an outline and shadows, and we're trying to make definitive statements about what it's going to look like. we got to be careful. But my theory is that we will be ruling with other Gentile believers before the administration of Israel came into place. So who's not a Jew? I like to think about this. I go, who am I going to be ruling and reigning? It's going to be kind of cool. Who's not a Jew in the Bible? That's a, but a believer that's very prominent. What about, what about Adam? Not a Jew. Noah? Not a Jew. Melchizedek? Oh, he's a guy I want to talk to. Right? So these guys are going to be like these, these par parallel with us. And a lot of things have been made about you know that these the, that those people are are even lower on the on the scale of importance. The church is up here, Israel's here, and then all of a sudden you have these non-Jew believers in the Old Testament are kind of waiting around until the age of ages. How do I know that? I've seen charts. Okay. So once again, the future kingdom is not about the church, and the church does not have a superiority over the promises of Israel. We will be at the wedding feast of the Lamb. But it's not us who's getting married. The language wedding, the brothel, the wedding feast are all Hebraic in nature. And there's a problem with, and I, this is the problem. This is the, I have a problem with taking that type of imagery, those types of statements, and saying that's for the church when it's all intended for Israel. If I'm going to err, I'm going to err on the side that, 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 that this information is about Israel. And again, we do have a parallel blessing, and we have a lot, more than we can ever imagine. But it's a parallel blessing, not a usurping one. All right. Hopefully that made sense. My conclusion for this lesson is I want to run through the 10 lessons, the 10 major points that I tried to cover in our lessons in ecclesiology. Okay? Now, again, I, it was supposed to be about the church, but I took... Of several lessons to build foundation, right? So number one, I, I talked about the difference between economy and administrators. That there's law, and then there's different administrators of the law as you go through the Old Testament. And then there's grace, and there's one administrator for grace. Now you have economy of law. This was one of the lessons. Economy of law and the economy of the law. So Noah was under a law. Adam was under a law. But the e law, the one that was ordained and given to people as kind of an inclusive you know, behavioral rightness was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. There are two different concepts there. I would even say even back then that all nations were under law. That is, that they could, that, that if they were idolaters, um, they were, um, you know, immor immoral, I'll just say it like that, immoral and also violent that God had and did often judge other nations based upon those three criteria. Where the law... Israel had a lot more rules to follow if they were to avoid, uh, to avoid uh, curses and to have blessings. Number three, the administration during this time um, 
the administrator during this time were various, sorry, during that time, not this time, that's weird. During that time were various families until God chose one family, one nation to administrate his law. And if we talk about Israel, is that previous administration, when we talk about the previous administration, we're not talking about the apostles, we're talking about Israel. So we have two different administrations there. There's a transference and a um, and a, a, a time of transition, but we'll talk about that when we get to Acts. Currently, we are under grace. That is our economy. We're not under law. The economy of grace does not refer to the method of salvation. That's always been by grace through faith, from Adam until end of time, when, when God, until the age of ages. They will always be saved based upon grace through faith. However, in order to uh, incur blessings in this life and to avoid curses, that was the, that that you had to follow the law. But under grace, it's free. When you're a believer, you can obtain all the blessings of God by grace, and you avoid all the blessings. Why? Because Christ took all the curses for us. Our current administration are believers in Jesus Christ, regardless of nationality, ethnicity, birthright, anything like that. We call this the church, the universal body of Christ, all believers everywhere, but I take out for all time. That's, that's not accurate. It's not for all time because, again, the church does not, there's no inference or any in, in implication that the church is in heaven currently, too. The local congregation is contrasted with the church because a local congregation is not the full body of Christ. And a small congregation cannot take on all the responsibilities that the church is. They do what they can with the resources that they are given. Paul talks about that when he writes to the Corinthian church in Philippians. That out of what you have, this is what you provided. So local congregations are microcosms of the body, but they're not the church, the entire body of Christ. And we have to make sure that we understand the difference there. A little bit of semantics, I play with that one. We also talked about the distinctions between the church, that is the universal body of Christ, and Israel, and how they were different. This is why we can't go back to the Old Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or Acts, to determine exactly what our responsibilities are as a church when we're, they're talking oftentimes about Israel. Number eight, the church has its own organization and structure. Do you remember what the organization or structure of the, of the universal body of Christ is? It's Jesus Christ, apostolic authority, and then everybody else. And all we do is kind of yield to that apostolic authority which has communicated Christ's thoughts and, and, and information to us. There's no human hierarchy in the universal body of Christ. There's nobody over in Japan who is the head of the church on earth. Nobody. There's no, this is why we don't like denominations or even call, you know, having another entity kind of try to tell us what we need to do here. We believe in autonomy of the local organization. So local organizations also have structure. We talked about eldership and what, and what the qualifications are there. There are teachers and there are people who serve within the church, but that's all kind of like it's, you know, Jesus Christ, the word of God, and elders are not there to rule, but to serve and to guide and to protect. And our last lesson today was the church ends at the rapture. And from that point, we are numbered with the saints from all time, and will return with Christ when he comes to rule and reign in his kingdom. Next week, we have some specials. All right, let's pray, and we'll go ahead and conclude. God in heaven, thank you so much for your word that we can go through the text, delineate, try to conclude some things, and, and kind of wet whistles, if you will, to, to kind of search out things to hopefully be able to gather a better understanding of who we are in you, what our responsibilities are, and also the future promises for, um, for us as believers and also for this entity called the church. We are thankful for it. Help us to be able to, to, uh, to build each other up in love and to be a witness to those who have not heard. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.